Good afternoon, everyone. We'll go ahead and call the Senate Committee on Growth and Infrastructure to order. Madam Secretary, will you please call the roll? Senator Hammond. Senator Hansen. Senator Pazina. Present. Senator Spearman. Here. Chair Harris. Here, thank you. Uh, given that we now have four members present, we have a quorum. Uh, so we will go ahead and uh, just open this up for the first hearing. We're calling this Daily Day uh, in Senate Growth and Infrastructure. It's my pleasure to have our newest colleague, Senator Daly, with us. Um, we'll open up the hearing on SB 85, unless you want to do 107 first, Senator. All right. Senate Bill 85 it is, which revises provisions relating to retention payments under certain highway contracts. Committee member Senator Daly has submitted an amendment that hopefully you all have on your desks or have had a chance to look at electronically. Okay. Um, Senator Daly, if you don't mind, you can go ahead and uh, speak as to the amendment. Very good, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Skip Daly, representing Senate District 13 for the record. I uh, have with me here uh, Craig Medole with the AGC, um, and they approached me uh, about putting this bill in. So essentially what we're trying to do and what the amendment does is take the retention language for DOT, for Department of Transportation, work only. It's different for state public works. We're not touching that. Um, back to what it was prior to 2019. So, and I think uh, Mr. Medole has some of the same uh, testimony, but in 2019, uh, Assembly Bill 22, which was brought by uh, DOT, wanted to change the retention uh, language to remove the $50,000 cap. They just wanted to make it 5%. And then after some discussions, negotiations, various things, we said the 5% is too high and we added all the language that we're proposing to take back out now. Uh, so I know Mr. Medol has some uh, additional information on how long it's taken DOT to close out jobs and various things on why uh, we think the $50,000 is the appropriate level. Uh, my understanding is DOT agrees. Uh, and uh, so that's what the bill does essentially is take us right back to where we were in 2019 before DOT's original proposal that says they can withhold 5% not to exceed 50,000, and that's where we're at. Happy to answer any questions unless you want to hear from Mr. Medole first. Do you have something you want to tell us? <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Craig Medole. I'm the CEO of the Nevada Chapter Associated General Contractors. Um, you know, when this bill, when Assembly Bill was 22 was passed in the 2019 session uh, with industry support, and one of the unspoken agreements we had with NDOT at that time is that they would reduce retention and close out projects in a timely manner. Right now, NDOT, like most state agencies, has a roughly 30% vacancy rate. They are taking months, if not years, to close out projects. Um, there's contractors here that will be able to speak to that today, but they just don't, frankly, have the manpower and they have a laborious process to reduce retention. So contractors are completing projects. The department's holding millions of dollars of their of the contractor's money, and it's not being released. I think it's important also to note that these projects are fully bonded, so the department is at no risk financially for the reduction in retention. The project, all projects for NDOT are fully bonded projects, and if the contractor doesn't perform or doesn't construct a quality project, the department has the ability to go after the contractor's bond and meet and be made financially whole. So with that, uh, I think Mr. Daly did a pretty good job of summarizing it, and I'm happy to ask, answer any questions as well. Okay, we'll open it up to committee members for questions. Senator Hansen. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, the whole retention thing has always been an interesting one. Patricia Farley, if you remember back in 2015, we got the one for residential and light commercial down to 5%. Um, if you guys are already bonded and everything else, why, why, are, why don't we eliminate the retention policy altogether? I mean, it's been a pain in the butt for construction uh, com companies, including my little one, forever. 
And so often that, that amount, that's your profit margin on an entire job, and it'll be months and months, and sometimes you got to go to court and everything else to collect that 5% or, or you know, my day 10%. So I'm kind of wondering why we just don't eliminate altogether, especially if you have a fully bonded project. Again, this is Craig Madol for the record. And Senator Hansen, um, I wouldn't disagree with you on that. Uh, we think $50,000 at least incentivizes the contractor to keep coming mm -hmm. back and doing a punch list items or anything else. Um, and it does give them some skin in the game. On these projects, $50,000 I think could be considered de minimis a lot of times. But uh, this is the way it had been in law for the prior 40 years. So all we're trying to do is just go back to that, the way it was for 40 prior years. Well, it was messed up for 40 years, and we can correct it now. Because, you know, this is one of the few industries where you actually have a, the ability of somebody supposed to pay their bills to just automatically get to hold back substantial sums of money that is legitimately owned. And, you know, I don't go to the store and say, I'm going to hold back 5% of what I'm paying the, the whatever until I'm sure the products I've got are, when I get home are, are acceptable to me. I mean, we're the only industry that I know of that has this retention policy, and it's just kind of, I don't know where it began, but it can be exceptionally onerous, so I'm just... You know, I, I, I see where you're going. I don't mean to wander off on a tangent, but yeah, it's a, it's a huge problem for the entire construction industry, in my opinion. Madam Chair, if I can follow up on that as well. Again, uh, Skip Daly, Senate District 13, for the record. Uh, I know one other thing that the retention has been used for and uh, having uh, worked in the uh, union sector for the union in my uh, previous career, right? Um, so a lot of times that uh, retention is leaned against or referenced whenever there's a wage complaint and various things. So having that retention there, at least on that, uh, if you removed it completely, I think you'd get opposition from several labor groups, including the one I used to work for. Uh, the 50000 you can argue whether it's enough or not or what it is, but uh, I think on highway projects and most of those that we should retain the 50000 at least go back to what it was. Uh, and, and there is a reason um, sometimes where it's useful in okay, well, cases. That makes some sense. Look, if, they, if you guys are using that basically as a buffer to, to potentially make sure you get paid for the, for the workers on the project, not just the contractors, but the guys doing the, doing the physical labor, that, that changes the dimensions a little bit in this. Yes, again, Skip Daly for the record. The um, Labor Commissioner's Office uh, has oftentimes, if there's a complaint, notified the agency, and then they would retain that until that's... Uh, uh, completed or, or that dispute is done. And it, it happens with subcontractors and other uh, vendors as well, potentially for contractors haven't been paid, they would notify the uh, agency of that. But uh, on the labor issue, for sure, I know it's, uh, it's, a, it's a factor. Has the labor commissioner had a chance to review this bill? I do not know, I would assume so. Uh, but they've never, was never on the table to have uh, retention removed completely, so. Very I don't good. Think, I hope it isn't. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Additional questions? All right. We'll go ahead and move on to uh, testimony. <coughs> Anyone here in support of Senate Bill 85 here in Carson City? Come on up. All right, go ahead, please. Good afternoon, Brian Reeder, speaking on behalf of the Nevada Contractors Association. Just want to thank the bill sponsor for bringing the bill and say that we support. Thank you. Madam Chair, Bill Wellman with Las Vegas Paving, <coughs> Nevada's largest contractor and uh, NDOT's largest contractor, and we're here in support of this bill. Thank you. Yes, hi, I'm Steve Blakely uh, with Road and Highway Builders. We're um, do quite a bit of work for the Nevada Department of Transportation, and we're here to support the bill. Good afternoon. Mark Markwell with Sierra Nevada Construction. We're a heavy highway contractor out of Sparks, Nevada, and we do a little bit of NDOT work. <clears throat> we do support this bill as well, and one thing of note that uh, hasn't been mentioned yet is sometimes it may take um, several months, sometimes uh, 18 months or more, for NDOT to close out their projects, so that's how long it takes for us to get retention. And I know some contractors, it's even been longer than that. So, thank you. Uh, Brandon Carlson with Granite Construction Company. And along the same lines, we, we fully support this bill. Um, sometimes it can take upwards of a year to get fully 
fully paid for our contracted work. So fully support this bill. Thank you. This is Steve Blakely, uh, the Road and Highway Builders again. Uh, taught what Mark brought up is uh, we've got jobs that have started in 2019 and all the way to 2022 that has still not been closed out. We've got a retention of 1.3 million being withheld from 2019 to 2022. If the $50,000 was come to effect, that'd be $450,000 being withheld. So we've got $850,000 we're waiting to get paid for. Thank you. Madam Chair, Seth Alexander with Ames Constructions. We do uh, large projects throughout the state of Nevada. Uh, I'm here in support of this bill. We have had one project that took up to three years for retention to be released, and that wasn't due to any issues on the project. That was just due to the process. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Oakes. I'm with Q&D Construction. Um, we've done a lot of projects here uh, in Reno and Sparks. We have currently three NDOT projects on Interstate 80 between uh, Fernley and Elko. So we support this project. There's a lot of retainage on, on those projects too, not including the spaghetti bowl and other ones that we've recently completed, so. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman. For the record, Danny Thompson, representing Operating Engineers Local 3 and 12. Uh, we support this bill as well. It's, it's, it's important that everybody be paid timely. Everybody wants to get paid on time, huh? Uh, we'll go ahead and go down to Las Vegas, a quick visual <coughs> check. There's no one there to, to testify uh, in any position. Uh, anyone here in Carson City want to come in opposition to Senate Bill 85? Oh, that's right. BPS, uh, before we take opposition testimony, can you please check the phone, see if there's anyone on the phones who'd like to testify in support of SB 85? Yes, Chair. If you'd like to testify in support, please press star 9 on your phone to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for support at this time. Okay. Uh, now we'll offer a, another opportunity if anybody wants to come testify in opposition to Senate Bill 85 here in Carson City. Okay, we have no one in Las Vegas either. Uh, can we check the phones for opposition testimony, please? If you'd like to testify in opposition, please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers at this time. Okay, uh, anyone wanna come and testify in the neutral position? for Senate Bill 85. All right, no one down south either. Uh, let's hit the phones one more time, please. If you'd like to testify in neutral, please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for neutral at this time. Okay. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and close the hearing then on Senate Bill 85, and we will open up the hearing on Senate Bill 107. And just members, for your information, we also have a proposed amendment by Washoe County to Senate Bill 107. <laughs> that amendment is considered friendly by the bill's sponsor, uh, and so we will have an opportunity to hear from uh, the uh, coroner's office, or at least from Washoe County's uh, government affairs liaison uh, after we hear the presentation from Senator Daly. You can go ahead and start whenever you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Skip Daly, representing Senate District 13, for the record, uh, here to present Senate Bill uh, 107. And again, I was uh, asked by uh, several of the contractors present here today in the AGC if we could uh, uh, bring uh, this bill. And it's 
entirely about highway safety, and there's some people here that can testify with their experience out on the roadways uh, and various things uh, in addition to the contractors regarding uh, why this bill is uh, uh, necessary and I think will promote safety on the highways. I know as we were preparing to uh, write this bill, we did reach out to the uh, Office of Public Safety, wanted to get their, their input on some various things, and I think uh, they're going to still testify in opposition, but that's fine. Some of the issues that they raised with us, we put into the bill, trying to address their concerns. Uh, one of them was they didn't want to have a uh, pub, just a regular public person have possession of these uh, potentially uh, marked and lights working only uh, vehicles. So that's how come we went with, you know, the first section, uh, subsection one of section one, where the DOT would actually retain and own the cars. There would be a permitting process through regulation and various things. Um, so that it's not going to be owned by the public, the DOT would have them and then allow uh, through a permitting process people to have possession of them. They wanted to say and make sure that it couldn't be stolen, someone could steal it and go on a joyride or whatever. So we put in there, as you can see, I think it's on uh, line 12, it's rendered incapable other than the markings and the lights. Nothing works, no radios. Um, uh, on that, so trying to address again some of their uh, concerns, uh, DOT to issue the permit. One of the questions was they w didn't want this to be used to protect property, and we said, no, no, we agree. It only can be used in there when work is being performed. Uh, we think in the regulations we might find that more workers actually in the work zone, because this is about protecting workers uh, in the work zones. And then the uh, lights being operable and some of the other technical issues that uh, uh, LCB wrote into the bill regarding about uh, impersonating an officer, that this would not be considered uh, impersonating uh, a police officer in that. So it really boils down to, I think, the main opposition is that uh, the flashing lights, uh, et cetera. I know I spoke to uh, one of the guys that worked uh, in the office with me. Uh, he's here today. He worked in traffic control on the highway for 20 plus years of his career before uh, coming to work in the office. Uh, and this is how he related to me. He says, yep, he says, we have the amber lights on the vehicles, on the construction. He says, people ignore the amber lights. Go by 80 miles an hour on the phone. They see the red and blue lights, 55, hands on the steering wheel, phones down they slow down. Uh, I know Mr. Medole has some testimony on statistics on what happens when they see the red and blue lights uh, in various things. Um, and having served in the position with the union when we've had members of my union killed in a work, work zone intrusion, it's not a fun day. But it's also about the motoring public. Motoring public is every bit as much a risk in these work zones and if they're not slowing down and, and watching for flaggers and various things, uh, the general public is at a higher risk as well of uh, being killed or severely injured in, in these work zones. So that's what we're trying to do. It's a safety bill, 100%, uh, and every little bit helps. Uh, I know the contractors are going to be able to tell you as well that they've requested to have highway patrol vehicles come to their work sites and various things. If manpower is powers available, uh, highway patrol, well, state police now, sorry, uh, will. Uh, but they haven't had manpower for that for quite some time. Uh, and uh, if we do this correctly and DOT is strategic about when they issue the permits and which ones uh, are, are in place, and then back that up with sometimes having an actual vehicle there to write the tickets so people you know, won't just say, oh, it's, it's, it's one of those uh, false cars and I don't have to follow it. I think it can be very effective. Number one, I can tell you, it will slow people down. I've seen it myself, uh, and there'll be people there that can uh, give you that same information. So I think that covers the main provisions of the bill. We did everything we could to address the concerns of public safety. Um, but if it just boils down to we're the only ones can use red and blue lights, fine. We, we addressed it through having DOT uh, own these things. So happy to answer any questions unless you want to hear from Craig first. 
So just for clarification, Senator, you're saying that you were speeding and then you saw the vehicle and you slowed down. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, was, uh, I was, having worked on this stuff for a long time, and one of the things uh, I, I would uh, mention is, clear back in, I made some notes, 2003, uh, I wasn't in the legislature, but uh, we got a person to sponsor AB 444, which created the double penalties in work zones. So it's been an issue for a long time. Having worked in the industry, knowing a lot of people, my own members, people that I know are out on those roadways, when I see the orange cones, I slow down. I may speed other places, but not in work zones. For the record. Uh, good afternoon Go again. Uh, you get two ugly guys in gray jackets back to back. Um, I'm Craig Madol, the CEO of the Nevada Chapter AGC, and I want to thank Senator Daly for sponsoring this bill. Um, you know, in April of 2014, AGC members formed a work zone safety working group with NDOT to, so, to discuss safety uh, issues in job sites that f affect the statewide uh, workforce. Um, several recommendations were taken from that, and one of them went to the Transportation Board, and then Governor Sandoval adopted a, a rule at NDOT to allow or to require, in certain circumstances, highway patrol vehicles be actively placed on those job sites. For several years, though, the use of those off-duty vehicles, and uh, they were required to be off-duty and overtime to be paid to the trooper in the car. Um, we've seen a significant reduction in the availability of those troopers. Depending on which region of the state you're in, the state police has somewhere between a 50 and 60 percent vacancy rate in those positions. And unfortunately, even at overtime rates, we're not able to get those, uh, those cars onto the construction sites to, to help mitigate the, the traffic in those sites. Um, and that's what the purpose of SB 107 is, as Senator Daly said. It allows NDOT to create regulations to allow contractors to use, utilize excess retired highway patrol vehicles with the stickers and lights that are rendered inoperable. I don't know if the department would remove the engine out of these vehicles, or, but the, they would have to be towed to and from the work sites. Um, as Mr. Daly stated, it would be while workers are present, and they would be secured in between the work shifts if necessary. Um, and. Additionally, I think the provisions of this law would only be used when an off-duty officer is not available. It is not our intent to replace the officers. It's to enhance the force and use this as a fo force multiplier, ultimately. Um, and again, like Mr. Daly stated, uh, one of the issues is that the state police recycles these light bars off of the retiring highway patrol vehicles to re reuse them on the new vehicles. We will pledge today that whatever, if there's 12 of these vehicles that need to be done or however we need to, we will purchase the replacement light bars for the highway patrol to make sure they're made whole on this. Um, we've, I talked to the Washoe County Sheriff. He uh, explained that to me, and he thinks that we could get the information to make that procurement upon passage of this bill. Um, lastly, I'd just like to take a minute to say what this bill is and what it is not. The bill is a way to increase job site safety and save the lives of the men and women constructing our roadways. The bill is a way to increase situational awareness of the traveling public when a work zone is, is uh, active. The bill is also proven, is a proven tool to decrease distracted drivers near job sites. The bill is not authorizing contractors to pose as law enforcement. It is also not a replacement for manned law enforcement vehicles when they are available. And it, uh, with that, I thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions, Senator Hansen. Thanks, Madam Vice Chair. A uh, couple of questions. I think he explained how it currently works. Now, I, I can think of two locations right now: uh, Mountain City, Elko County. They've got a sheriff's, an old used sheriff's vehicle sitting right alongside the highway, and in Dyer, down in Fish Lake Valley, they've got. In Esmeralda County, an old used sheriff's thing. And when you come into town, boy, and you see those lights, even though that thing hasn't moved probably in years, it's like, phew, you hit the brakes. Right now, though, you have to pay overtime to an off-duty 
guy to just sit in the cars. I've seen them. They just sit there with the lights going. So when you come into the, into the work zone, you slow way down. What you guys are proposing, though, is that you'll just buy old used vehicles that don't work, tow them there, have the lights on with just, what, a rent-a-cop sitting inside of the thing? Or, I mean, and, and uh, the danger I see, I mean, once that people realize that those guys don't have the ability to pull anybody over, I, I just have a hard time seeing that maintaining its effectiveness. I, I know that Senator Daly did mention that this would be a backup plan if the other guys are unavailable, but it sounds like you're going to have kind of a both occasionally too because by having a parked vehicle there that you guys have purchased, but you also will occasionally have a, a, a regular highway patrolman, state trooper, or whatever, to make sure that that thing keeps its effectiveness over time. Is that kind of the, the game plan I'm looking at here? Uh, yeah, this is Craig Madol for the record. Um, I think you, you've got it pretty well there, Senator Hansen. I think that one of the issues is the job, the, it's actually NDOT pays the overtime. It's done through the force account on the construction site, so the contractor doesn't directly pay it. It's charged to the job. NDOT pays the overtime. Um, and, yes, I think that by the time you've slowed down, you've seen that, oh, geez, that car is one of the ones with, that's not occupied, you've already slowed down. It already was effective. And you're paying attention, and that's really the intent here, is just to get the traveling public to slow down at these job sites, pay attention, and by the time they've passed that car, they're in the active construction zone anyway, and traffic's going slower. And, and is it currently illegal to have a used car there with just lights on the top of it? Again, this is Craig Madol for the record. Uh, that is my understanding that only active police cars may have these flashing red and blue lights on them, pursuant to state law. Okay. Thank you. Madam Vice Chair and Madam Chair. <laughs> okay, we'll go to uh, Senator Hammond and then Senator Pazina and then Senator Spearman. Senator Hammond. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, quick question. Um, I want to make sure I understand the contents of the car, the vehicle. The vehicle is purchased. It's uh, basically it's an old uh, used up police vehicle, uh, whether it's state police. And state police, right, is what it's going to be using. Um, <coughs> Nothing is functioning in there. There's no engine, from what I understand. Nothing's working other than the lights. So there's no siren. Is that correct? Uh, tell me, I mean, everything that's in there, that's going to be operable, I guess. This is Craig Madol for the record. That is exactly our intent, that the light bar would work. The light bar is really what we're after here. That would slow the traffic down. The car would not be able to be driven. It'd have to be towed to and from. I think the one correction is NDOT would technically own the vehicles. NDOT would then permit the contractor to use them on the job site. And as a follow-up, just to make sure I was really clear, because I'm pretty sure I heard this, you're first seeking to um, employ somebody over time <laughs> if there's somebody available, and secondarily use the vehicle if there's nobody available um, that can be used. And that's, that's the, the, the preferred um, operation. This is Craig Madol for the record, and yes, that is the intent. Thank you. Okay, Senator Spearman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so if you don't do this, what's the alternative? Or is there an alternative? Uh, Skip Daly again for the record, Senate District 13, um, Madam Chair. Uh, if, uh, if we're unable to do this, then we would have to just stick with the plan where we would call to see if there's an officer off duty uh, available uh, to be on the work site, which has been our experience lately that they're not available. Uh, and uh, we would not have this option to get people to slow down on the work zones. Uh, and there are issues. I mean, we just did the spaghetti bowl project. I know uh, several wrecks, you don't hear about them, thankfully, you know, uh, but not only if there's a fatality, the motoring public on the job, it, unfortunately it impacts that person, but it also affects the workers uh, in that work zone, whether they get uh, a hit or not. There is no other real option uh, available unless we have a bucket of money to, to spend on it and hire a bunch of highway patrols at higher wages and stuff. So hopefully we'll address that issue separately. But um, So this is designed to, um, what's the word for it, save lives? Okay. Um, and with just a, a car there, the, the, the bubblegum machine lit up, uh, do you have, can you say, Siri, turn the lights on? 
uh, and uh, this is Craig Madol for the record, I believe that, you know, it would be towed to the job site. One of the employees at the job site would flip the switch to turn on the lights. I'm sure I'm oversimplifying it a little bit, but um, that we do have two safety managers for large highway construction companies here with us today, and I think that they can speak to a lot of what the effect will be. Yeah, and Madam Chair, it's not a question, but a comment. Uh, <clears throat> so one of the things that we used to do um, is we would switch up empty car and then occupied car and people never knew which one it was. So, just saying. And Madam Chair, if I can, Skip Daly again for the record to answer your question 100% about safety. All right, um, I just have a couple of questions myself. Um, <clears throat> so, this is a, uh, DOT is almost acting as a third party here an intermediary between the contractor and getting the highway patrol car well, state police vehicle is that right madam chair skip daily again for the record yes and that was one of the uh, uh requests that we had when we spoke with the department of public safety is that they didn't want these vehicles to be totally in control of private sector right uh, so that's we came up with the process, which got us a two-thirds vote on this, by the way, but nevertheless, I think we'll be okay. Um, the uh, DOT would actually have, and they already own the cars. They bought them in the first place, so when they're timed out uh, and they're uh, ready to not be in service active anymore, DOT would have them. They'd take care of replacing the light bars, and then they would be the ones that have control and custody, issue the permit, uh, and have come total control over when, where, how, uh, et cetera. And was the Department of Transportation unwilling to do the tow to the location for you? Madam Chair, uh, Skip Daly again for the record. I, I don't know if DOT is willing or unwilling or how they do that. I think that would be part of the permitting on, on how that happened. I don't believe DOT would be there every day to take it off the road and on the road again. That would be a contractor, but that would all be covered under the permit, as I understand it, and they would adopt rules or regulations on how they were going to administer that. Well, Senator Daly, I think what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is maybe there's some arrangement that contractors can have with the Department of Transportation. Department of Transportation just comes out, drops the vehicle off at a construction site, and then they'll come and pick it up for you. And then you pay the fee, yes, maybe for the service, but you don't have to go through an entire, a whole licensing process. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Maybe like, a, almost like DOT sets up a program where contractors can rent it and they will deliver the car to the location for you and then come and pick it up uh, whenever the, the time is over. And again, Skip Daly for the record. Uh, I suppose they could do that, and I wouldn't be opposed to it. If DOT wanted to uh, manage it that way, uh, they could. I just don't know that it would be as feasible as that in all locations. There's a lot of rural roads out there, and there's a lot of, I mean, they all have DOT inspectors, but they don't all have the same vehicle. Not often are they there with a trailer to tow a vehicle back and forth to the yard. So I think there would have to be, at least on some projects, uh, cooperation with the contractors. Do you know what the expected fee might be for for using these vehicles? And how long would a permit be issued for, right? Are you envisioning that this is a 30-day permit or um, maybe just a day-by-day -day permit, right? What do you, How do you see that working? Uh, Madam Chair, again, Skip Daly for the record. Uh, I believe the bill says that DOT, the fee will be set based on their actual costs, right? So... Uh, what it'll actually be, don't know. They have to set up a program, do the things, et cetera. Um, I know a lot of times they have a, um, a number of working days that they establish for a project. It could be the number of working days. They could limit it. I think that would all be questions for uh, DOT on when they issue the permit and how many days do we think we need it. I don't need it for all, you know, 280 working days on the job. 
you know, the first part of its mobilization, et cetera, et cetera, when, they're, when they have a paving crew out there and they have a lot of trucks in and out and various things, I think those would be the more effective days to have the vehicle on the road. And that would just be a case by case coordinated with DOT uh, on that. And then there's weather related days that they're not there. So it's, I think that's something, details that DOT would have to work out and couldn't answer for every job uh, in a setting. Uh, like today let's say um, one of these vehicles is parked on the side of the street and someone hits it <clears throat> does the contractor provide insurance for the vehicle would it be Department of Transportation how do you how do you envision you know insurance and liability being handled uh, skip daily again for the record good question um, I think that would be one of the things that DOT would have to look at. Uh, technically, I don't think the vehicle not being registered, any of that, would have to have insurance, although I think you would want to have insurance. And I know the contractors have insurance for accidents and various things that happen in their work zone, so it may already be covered, may just have to make the state an additional insured on their existing insurance policy. The contractors can help answer that question, but that's how I would imagine that would be handled. All right, one last one, I promise. Um, would it have to be a qualified licensed tow truck operator moving the vehicle back and forth or are you just envisioning any contractor with a tow truck could go get it and, and bring it out? How would that work? I was just, Greg was, skipped daily again for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my understanding is, and it's uh, not... Uh, for sure, most contractors I'm believing are going to use a trailer, not uh, an actual tow truck. Although that's not written into the bill, um, it could be something that's uh, put into the permit. So typically, I think it's going to be done with the trailer back and forth to the location on the job site uh, by the by the contractor. Is uh, but no, they would they they would the contractor would generally do that. There wouldn't be a somebody they hired, although they could, uh, but they probably would not. All right, um, I'll invite Washoe County up to quickly speak to their amendment. It's, it's pretty small, um, but if you wanna just give us a, a little brief overview of, of what you're proposing and why, that'd be great. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Cadence Matievich, C-A-D-E-N-C-E-M-A-T-I-J-E-V-I-C-H, uh, and I am the Government Affairs Liaison for Washoe County. Um, my thanks to the committee for considering this amendment and to the sponsor and proponents for considering it to be friendly. It is somewhat tangential to the genesis of, of the bill, but it does relate to safety on our roadways. Um, and so the amendment uh, comes at uh, page three of the bill in line 12. Uh, we would be adding a new section to the list of vehicles that are considered to be emergency vehicles, uh, that that would be a vehicle operated by a coroner or a medical examiner. And the reason that we're looking to have this added, um, there is a measure that we're working with NDOT on in the other house. I won't say the name because then it pops up on everybody's Nellis's notices. Um, that would allow for uh, emergency vehicles to uh, operate on the paved shoulder of a highway when responding to traffic crashes. Um, and in the unfortunate instance where that crash were a fatality, getting the coroner and medical examiner to the site of the crash in as expeditious a manner as possible is in the interest of safety on our roadways. Um, oftentimes until many, in those unfortunate instances, until the medical examiner or coroner can get there, the incident can't be resolved. And so we have significant delays on our roadways. We've been advised by NDOT um, that unless the coroner's vehicles are included in this list of emergency vehicles that are authorized to operate red lights and have the permit, therefore, um, that we would not be able to be included in those provisions. Uh, and so, uh, again, a appreciation to Senator Daly uh, for allowing us this opportunity uh, to, to get that into the statute. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, members, any questions on the amendment? Okay. We will then, again, open it back up 
uh, for testimony, testimony in support of SB 107 here in Carson City. Oh, I made it easy for you guys, doing it all in one day. Okay, let's hear it. Hello, Madam Chair and everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on this bill. My name is Michael Oakes. I am the Corporate Safety Director for Q&D Construction. Um, I also have a unique perspective in this. At, uh, I've got 31 years in the fire service, uh, still active reserve uh, here locally, and know a lot of the law enforcement personally. And um, when we saw this bill coming through, uh, we support it wholeheartedly. Uh, I was kind of chomping at the bit because I've got a lot of answers to the questions you guys had. Um, I guess first and foremost, uh, and we had a fatality uh, September 26 of 2022 at the lake where we had a DUI driver come into our work zone and, and strike one of our traffic flaggers. Um, it was a rough one for me because uh, you know, I've, I've been around a lot of accidents and, and seen a lot of things go wrong, but it was different that it was one of my employees. So we're wholeheartedly, uh, again, behind this bill. Um, I know for a fact, like I said, having the tie-in with law enforcement, the, the struggle is the understaffing, talking to the lieutenants. They can't get enough troops to cover the roadways here in town um, just because they're limited. Um, the other issue that we see is the way their schedule is. So Highway Patrol works typically a uh, Sunday to Wednesday, and then the other shift is Wednesday to Saturday. So there's a Wednesday overlap where everybody's on shift and nobody's available. Um, one of their requirements is uh, they have to have a reset. They're not allowed to work a day and then do an overtime shift that night. So we're seeing on average of our contracts that we request help for filled at around 40%. So, um, you know, it's a real struggle for us t to get uniform officers on these roadways. Um, just looking at some studies out there, uh, there's one that came out of um, Texas. They found that a stationary patrol car uh, reduced the average speed on the roadways um, anywhere from 6 to 22% speed reduction. Um, there's another one that came out of South Dakota that they saw averages drop from uh, 30 to 25 miles an hour, uh, different things. So it, we're looking for the visual, visual acuity. It, it, like um, Mr. Daly said and, and Mr. Medole said that when you come over the hill to Mr. Hansen's point and you see that, that, that triggers that in, in people's heads and, and slows them down. So um, you're at about, you're a little over two minutes. So gotcha. if you could wrap so it up. That's, that's what we're trying to, to deal. We don't want to personally, we just want to supplement because we struggle to get help. So um, I think the question was asked, what's the other options for years? We haven't had any other options. We've been at zero if nobody's available. Uh, Brandon Carlson, for the record, Regional Safety Manager with Granite Construction. Uh, just to segue what Mr. Oaks had to say, uh, there's nothing that slows the public down um, like seeing blue and red lights. I think we all know that. All right, we can add as many signs out there. We can add as many customized signs, you know, where your families, friends, neighbors, things like that where we try to personalize ourselves. We're the citizens. We're the coworkers. We're part of the community. Um, still there's nothing that slows the public down like blue and red lights. So if we're just talking about supplementing, uh, being able to backfill, having troopers on our jobs, I think that's a pretty fair ask is to have those folks out there and to have a vehicle out there. And we're talking about the, the safety of our employees and the public. There is no greater risk to our employees out in the field than the traveling public. People going 65 miles an hour, intermixing with our equipment, people on the roads, uh, it's a dangerous situation. So it's the best for the public, it's the best for us, and all we're asking is that we're supplementing a current process uh, with, frankly, equipment that we already own, state already owns. Um, so I think it's a fair ask when you're talking about the name of safety of our employees and the public. Uh, there's no other way to do it. That's what slows folks down, It's the blue and reds. Uh, Brian Reeder, speaking on behalf of the Nevada Contractors Association, just wanna thank the sponsor and urge your support. Uh, Jake McNeil, for the record, I'm here as a member of and representing Laborers Local 169, and I'm the guy Skip was talking about. Uh, we're here in, to testify in support of this bill. I worked in the field for 20 years, 
asphalt paving all the highways here in town and the red and blue lights really get people to slow down and pay attention like he kind of stole my thunder on the story but dropped their cell phone two hands on the wheel turn the radio down really pay attention and it's, it's about saving lives and safety and we're in support of it thank you good afternoon madam chairman for the record danny thompson representing the operating engineers local three and twelve and you know, it's tough enough on these jobs dealing with the complex big pieces of equipment that they that they use, and then to have to worry about being hit by a car doing 65 miles an hour. Uh, so anything that we can do to prevent that from happening, uh, we support. Thank you. Madam Chair, for the record, Seth Alexander, Vice President with Ames Construction. Um, I just want to add a couple facts, um, figures. Uh, the Spaghetti Bowl Express project was mentioned. That's a relatively large project here in Nevada. Um, we had uh, over 150 uh, vehicle accidents that could have potentially led to the injury of an employee on that site. So that's not uh, fender benders, that's uh, serious accidents with uh, police and EMS response uh, where there could have definitely been harm to a worker. Um, state police worked with us very closely on that project. We got a little bit higher uh, fill rate on the off-duty officers. We were a little over 50% but that means 50% of the time our employees are out there working at night with no protection from red and blue lights to slow drivers down. So I think this is a great bill and uh, it will offer better protection to those people working on the highway at night. Thank you. <coughs> Madam Chair, members, uh, Bill Wellman, Las Vegas, <coughs> excuse me, Las Vegas Paving. Um, this, as Mr. Alexander just said, is a great bill. We've looked for something like this for many, many years. Uh, I did not bring any stats with me, but clearly I think most everybody in this room, including you folks, have seen the incidents in our construction work zones throughout the entire state. This is not about just work zone safety for our employees. It's, it's critical for sure, but we have had many uh, fatalities with just the public with uh, through uh, road closures, detours, and those type of things. And many innocent people have been hurt in themselves because of an errant driver, whether impaired or not. This is not new. Um, Boulder City has been doing this for 40 years, setting a, a vehicle in the median as you approach Boulder City to, de to deter uh, speeding. When we built project, um, uh, South Design Build Project, where all the animals are near Mandalay Bay on I-15, part of that, that that work area included for a finished product uh, pads for NHP to set the same exact type vehicles in place um, throughout the day for for uh, for traffic calming after construction. They worked with RTC and NDOT, and it worked very uh, greatly. Uh, and they talk about that uh, regularly. So this is not new, um, and you see flashing lights in parking lots where law enforcement is trying to deter other things as well. As I said, flashing lights do deter everybody. And yes, Senator Ham and I was probably one of those people that was going a little too fast and I did slow down when I seen it regardless. Uh, and I'm sure most of the people in here. Anyway, we, uh, we highly support this and hope you support it as well. Thank you. Madam Chair, Mark Markle, Sierra Nevada Construction. Uh, we also encourage you to support this bill. Uh, we do a lot of work with NDOT, especially in the rural areas, and we do ask for NHP to provide some support, and rarely do we are we able to get a patrol car. Um, I just was talking to our safety department and just put down some statistics um, of some recent incidents we had in our construction zone. We lost three arrow boards that were hit either by a drunk driver or distracted driver. Um, and two of those were in a school zone. We had an incident where a driver spread, uh, sped through a road closure and hit one of our colleagues and his vehicle. Fortunately, he was not severely injured. And we had um, an intersection where we had a, a fatal DUI accident and we had a student uh, walking across the street and was bumped by a distracted driver. So all that stuff, <clears throat> maybe it's not on the end dot right away, but it just shows you the, the serious issue we have with distracted drivers, and we would support this. One, one answer to the question that Madam Chair asked, I think the way it would work is we would consider this like a rental, a rental piece of equipment, and the contractors would indemnify 
the DOT through our contract. So right now we would have to indemnify for anything, and that would I would see that that's how it would work. Would go through an insurance company. Thank you, Madam Chair. Steve Blakely here with Threaten Highway Builders. Uh, us to also do uh, quite a bit of work in rural Nevada. I'd say about for uh, Nevada Department of Transportation, probably about 90% of our work is in rural. And we also have very um, having problems trying to get uh, law enforcement out there on our jobs. So again, I support the bill. Thank you. Okay, anyone else here in Carson City want to come and testify in support? All right, not seeing any quick visual check down south. There's no one there to testify as well. Uh, BPS, would you mind going to the phone to see if anyone wants to testify in support of SB 107? Thank you, Chair. There are no callers for support at this time. Okay, anyone uh, here in Carson City would like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 107? Okay. Not seeing anyone in Las Vegas either. A uh, quick phone check for any opposition testimony, please. Chair, there are no callers for opposition at this time. Okay. Uh, anyone want to testify in the neutral position on Senate Bill 107? No movement here in Carson. Uh, no movement in Las Vegas. And let's go to the phone lines one more time. Sure, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing then on Senate Bill 107, and that will bring us to public comment. Is there anyone here in Carson City who'd like to give public comment? Okay, no one in Las Vegas either. Uh, BPS, anyone on the phone for public comment? Sure, the public line is open and working. However, there are no callers at this time. All right. Uh, with that, then, the committee is adjourned. Have a great day, everybody.